the g-force is constant and your stomach is three miles down the road I would say that I'm a motorsport fan more than I am a car fan. Uh, my love for anything with an engine came really from F1 and, and motorsport. So growing up, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be an F1 driver, I wanted to be an F1 champion, uh, but I ran out of skill and money. Uh, I like to blame money, but it was more realistically skill. So that never, never really happened for me. But I've always been looking for ways to be involved with that sport somehow. And so when I left school, I went to like all the F1 teams, the, so many of them are based in the UK, and I was like, just give me a job, any job. Uh, you can't really do that, apparently. You have to uh, have skills uh, <laughs> or be trained in something. And I was like, I'll just sweep the garage floor. And so that didn't work out, so I went down a different uh, path in life, but eventually ended up working in sort of uh, publicity and PR, mainly for large events, and so that ended up being a few uh, F1 sponsor events. So I started to sort of get involved here and there, and again, I was like, okay, I've got to somehow get involved with F1. I love this sport so much. And, you know, I, I genuinely, I mean, since 1996, I think I've watched every single F1 race to date. Fine, I might skip a few because of things that are going on, but I watched the full rerun. So I, I really am that obsessed. And eventually I quit my job just before YouTube and set up a little PR publicity consultancy. And my whole aim was to, to only do F1 sponsors or F1 related clients. And I got a handful, but it was all a bit of a disaster. And, you know, so uh, that led to me eventually starting my YouTube channel as a hobby, as a way to distract myself from my disastrous career move. Anyway, uh, YouTube has somehow allowed me to get closer to F1 than I could have ever dreamt. And that came to a head uh, last year when I ended up actually driving an F1 car. So this was part of a big uh, campaign I was working on with Infinity, who uh, a sponsor of the Renault F1 team. And part of the campaign was uh, a customer activation event where they take you to the French Grand Prix circuit and let you drive a 2012 Formula One car. Now, there are plenty of places you can go in the world that you can drive a Formula One car. And it's often the shell of a car with a Ford Mustang engine, or it's a old 1980s F1 car with four gears instead of six. And, you know, they're not real experiences. This is as close as a normal human being could ever get to driving an F1 car without actually driving an F1 car. So it's run by the official Formula One team. You go there, you have to go through various bits of training. Uh, the car is running 15,000 RPM instead of 18,000 RPM and six gears instead of seven. And it has ABS and traction control. Those are in place because some of the people that get to do this event can literally be people that have never driven anything except their Infinity Q, whatever. So they have to put some safety parameters in place. But what I love is that they can dial in and dial out those, you know, sort of uh, controls depending on the driver's ability. So throughout the day, you build up to this experience by driving other single-seater open-wheel cars. You also do some laps in some, you know, ordinary road cars, even in a van. And they sort of judge you. And so when you get into the F1 car, they go, okay, this guy doesn't need any traction control or this guy needs all the traction control. But as I say, it would probably arguably be 75 or 80% of the real deal. And for me, for sure, is the closest I'm ever getting to driving an F1 car, especially given my height. Uh, you don't get many six foot two Formula One drivers, so I had to really wave goodbye to that dream a long time ago. So I was so nervous, but so excited because, as I say, this has been a dream of mine since I was five or six years old, and something which I'd probably thought was never actually going to happen. So I go down to France, I've got the whole day. The, the morning is arguably the best part of the day because you get put in something called a Formula 4 car, which is a junior series, a feeder series, like Indy Lights, but turned down even further. Uh, but the cars are super fun. You're in them by yourself. You get two 30-minute sessions. You're racing against a clock. You're not really supposed to be racing other people on track, but inevitably you do. And you're on a Formula One circuit, so you are going all out. And I'm there like, you know, back into my karting zone. Like, I was meant to do this. But really getting into it. And then after lunch is your F1 drive. Now, you have to be uh, clear it's three laps. So the main reason they do this is that after three laps, people tend to get cocky or too confident and start driving recklessly. But also, physically, very few people can withstand the G-forces post three laps. <laughs> I have to explain this because I, as a fan, understand that F1 drivers are athletes. Most people tend to knock this and go, what do you mean they just sit there and drive a car? It's nothing about it. But 
you have to realize that they are going through four to five G every single corner on their body, on their neck, on their arms, because the cornering speeds are so high and the braking forces are so extreme. So I knew going into the experience, the things that were gonna blow me away were the acceleration, no doubt. It's a car that does naught to 100 miles an hour in two seconds or two and a half seconds. Potentially the cornering speeds, although would I really experience downforce? Because that kind of break between mechanical grip and aerodynamic grip is so slim and so far. You have gotta be going like 120 miles an hour plus before you're starting to see the aerodynamics. And then the braking. A lot of people have said to me, the braking is what will blow you away. And anyone who hasn't driven a race car before might not know that usually the brake pedal in a race car is like a brick wall. It's like the firmest pedal you've ever experienced in your life. And you have to stamp on it to get any kind of like movement. So you get put into the F1 car, they sit you down in the seat and you actually lie down in a Formula One car. So your, your feet are up here, your, your, your hands, your steering wheel's right in front of your face and you can kind of barely see over. You just see the tops of the tires and you're kind of lying down. It is quite comfortable, but a little claustrophobic. Your feet are in stirrups so that you can't cross on the pedal. So your left foot braking. And before you're allowed out on the track, they say, okay, can you uh, push the brake pedal for you? So, and I'm, I'm ready and I push it pretty hard. And they're like, no, harder, harder. And I'm pushing it like harder to the point where I'm like pushing myself back into the seat. I can hardly breathe. And they're like, okay, that's 75% brake pressure. You got to hit that for every corner or the brakes won't work. And I'm like, oh no, I can't do that. Like, you'll be fine. I'm like, no, what? So in my head, I'm like, oh, this is just so terrifying. And the emotions of the experience, everything about it is just so overwhelming that I'm not really taking the moment in. So by the time you actually get in to drive the car and you're belted in, they start up the engine and they push you out to the pit lane because it's too hard to engage the clutch. And you roll away and you're very smooth. You have to just let the clutch out real slow and then the car starts to trickle forward. Not like F1 drivers, they obviously help you with that, but... Off you go. And of course, the initial reaction is the acceleration. Barbaric. I mean, like nothing you've ever experienced before. Take the fastest road car you've ever been. And I'm talking about people who've driven LaFerraris or McLaren Senna's or whatever you might think. Formula One is faster. <laughs> and the biggest thing is it's endless. I always feel like in a road car, there is an acceleration curve, no matter how fast you're in. Even in a Koenigsegg or a Pagani, after that initial gut-wrenching acceleration, it smooths off. In Formula One, that doesn't give up. You know, the G-force is constant and your stomach is three miles down the road until you hit the brakes. But I'm kind of expecting that because it's Formula One, right? So I floor the, the accelerator and I'm like, oh my God. And you know, your head's banging around, all of this. And then I get to the corner and I arguably I'm not doing that fast at that first corner. So I turn in and it's unbelievably smooth and easy. Actually a lot easier to drive than the little Formula 4 cars because of the mechanical grip. The mechanical grip is so high that it's just, I'm like, oh, I am so good at this. I'm like, I am so good at this. Flowing through the corners, the back's not stepping out. I see the straight and I'm like, here we go. This is it. So I just go all the way down to second gear and floor it. And it's the most amazing experience. It feels like being strapped to a rocket ship. And I get to the end and all I remember is these sort of voices inside my head going, use the brakes. You know, like all the people that I've text beforehand or my racing driver friends or people that I know just saying, what should I do? They're saying, use the brakes. So I'm hurtling towards this first corner. And in the Formula 4 car, I was breaking the 200 meter mark. And I look down and I see the 50 meter mark and I'm like, let's go for it. You know, what's the worst that's gonna happen? It was a big runoff. If I die, I die in Formula One, you know, the way I wanted to go. So I just go and I'm doing this and I see the 50 meters and I push the brake as hard as I can do it. My head, <laughs> the G-forces takes my helmet and everything down into the cockpit. I can't see a thing. I'm like, oh, oh trying to shift down gears. By the time I can finally lift my head up, the corner's there, so I'm like, Oof! turn into the corner, the whole thing goes like this, I'm like, Oof! absolutely like, as I say, I couldn't, ex I've never experienced anything like that, and I won't ever again. And I finally get back to the pit lane, and I get out, and the guy goes, oh, you did a great job, you hit 40% brake pressure, well done. <laughs> 40%? He goes, yeah, that's pretty good for a first timer. And I'm like, how is that 40% if the real drivers are hitting 100% every time 
And it wasn't just the fact that I applied as much leg pressure as, as I could. Like I stamped on that pedal so hard, but it was the forces my body went through. My lungs were like at the front wheels. As I said, my head was in, well, you know, in a not a nice place to be. All of it was so overwhelming that my respect for F1 drivers just went through the roof. Not only their physical ability, but the mental capacity to be able to do all of that and be fighting and looking where the opposition are and speaking to your team and, and switching controls. It was a completely sort of a recalibration of what uh, a car could do. And the funny thing is, is that the team that run the cars on the day say the thing that people struggle with the most with an F1 car is actually how high the idle point is. The engines idle at around 9,000 RPM. And as I say, usually they shift at around 18,000 RPM. So you're always at, ah! that's like forever. You roll out of the pitch, you're like, ah! and people can't get used to it. So they let the revs drop too low or they shift too early because your ears just aren't used to that higher pitch. And all the fluids and everything don't pass through the engine or they get cold and everything dries up. And I actually experienced this. I was the only person on the whole day to suffer any kind of issue. Okay, I didn't crash, but I did have a mechanical issue because obviously this whole like, use the brakes. Before I got onto the main straightaway, I was trying to see what these brakes would do. So I was in like second gear trundling around a corner. I thought I better stamp on the brakes and see what happens. So there I go, I stamp on the brakes and everything just went Vroom. And all the revs dropped and I was in the wrong gear and the anti-stool kicked in. So I'm there, my first ever F1 experience, and the car just cuts out. And you have no pit, you have no car to pit radio. They can speak to you, but you can't speak to them. So I'm just free rolling, literally around this last corner, and I see the pit lane, and I have to roll, thank God I had enough speed, back into the pits. And everyone's sitting there going, what's this guy doing? And I'm like, I think I broke it. <laughs> so the only guy the whole day that like screwed up the program, given that I was the person most excited and probably should have known that was something you shouldn't do. But you just have to keep the revs up. You have to keep the, the energy and everything moving, the temperatures up. It's an amazing machine in the fact that the only way to drive it is flat out the minute you leave the pit lane. There's no warm up procedures, nothing. They've done that for you already with machines and computers. So the minute you leave that pit lane, you have gotta be on it or the car is just gonna give up on you. And uh, that was a lesson to learn. We'd like to thank Avalon King for their continued support of the VinWiki YouTube channel. You can go to the link in the description below to get a discount on their Armor Shield 9 ceramic coating. Let's go live with Andrew from Avalon King to learn more about their Black Friday special. So they're like, yeah, yeah, you're, you're reporting from the field. You should do it in an actual field. I'm like, give me a break. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we're running a, a Black Friday sale from November 28th to the 30th. You get up to 60% off your order if you use the code Black Friday. Uh, you can see that I'm actually reporting to you from a field. And that's all the time we've got for today. Thank you, Andrew. Bye.